Okay, welcome to the training. Today, we're going to be talking about the top five scene writing mistakes and how to fix them. I'm really excited about this training. Um, uh, we've been planning on doing this for a while, and so I've just been thinking through everything I want to share. Uh, and so thank you so much for being here and being a part of this training. Uh, we're going to we're gonna cover a lot over the next 90 minutes or so, uh, so we're going to get rolling here. So just so you know what it's going to look like. Um, during this, uh, we're going to do, I'm going to do a quick introduction here, and then we're going to get into the teaching. I'm going to cover everything I promised to teach and talk about those five mistakes and the tools uh, that we use at StoryGrid to fix them. And then I'm going to tell you about our program, the Masterwork Scene Writing Course, and why today is the best day to join that. And then we'll do a Q&A. And so um, just so you know, uh, as I go, I'm going to be paying mostly attention to the training and I will not be able to catch all the questions. So if you can save your questions as we go through it, at the end, I'll ask them, I'll get you to submit the questions and I'll roll through as many as I possibly can. So maybe uh, you don't know much about me or StoryGrid. And so I want to give you a little bit about uh, who we are and what we do here at StoryGrid. So my name is Tim Grawl. I'm a writer and I'm the CEO of StoryGrid. So I do uh, all of the operations and marketing at StoryGrid, but also first and foremost, I'm a writer. And this is where, uh, this is how Sean and I, the uh, founder of StoryGrid got connected is I wanted to learn how to write. I picked up a copy of uh, the book, The Story Grid, fell in love with it, reached out to Sean. We started a podcast and a quick eight years later, here we are. And so uh, today you're going to be hearing from me throughout the entire presentation, but uh, StoryGrid is definitely not just me. Uh, we have Sean Coyne. Uh, he's the founder and creator of StoryGrid. He's the uh, editor and writer with over 30 years of experience. He wrote the book, The StoryGrid, many of our other titles, and everything that I'm teaching today Everything that we teach in our programs all comes from Sean's work on narrative theory and helping writers uh, tell better stories. Uh, Danielle Kiowski is our chief academic officer. She runs all of the StoryGrid University side of things. Uh, she teaches most of the classes over there. Leslie Watts is our editor-in-chief of StoryGrid Publishing. Uh, she also does all of the training of our editors now, and she helps uh, with the training in, uh, for the writers as well. And so along with us, we have StoryGrid certified writers. We have other people that help around StoryGrid. Um, but it all comes back to this common goal of why we're here at StoryGrid. And we're trying to help you write stories that readers love so much they tell their friends. And I know this is what I want. Uh, one of the, my favorite things about working with StoryGrid is that I came into it as a fan first. Uh, I'm, I'm a writer. I've written five books. Uh, I actually just finished uh, the draft of my six that is on Leslie Watts desk and she's uh, working through the editing on that. And, um, and this is what I want to do. I want to write stories that readers love so much they tell their friends I want to write, I want to write books that people are still reading 10 20 years, maybe 100 years after I've written them. And it's that's a big goal. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to do here at StoryGrid. So everything that we do on this webinar and our trainings is really towards this idea of helping you write stories that readers love so much they tell their friends about them. And so this is kind of how it goes uh, for us writers, right, is that we get excited about a story and we sit down at the typewriter, uh, maybe not the typewriter anymore, but we sit down and we start typing, 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 just burning it up, figuring out how to get our first draft out into the world. And then once we have a draft, we hand it up. Uh, we hand up our manuscript to some editing god that we hope will both uh, tell us our story is amazing and awesome, but also help us fix it, right? Make it better. Um, and what is really uh, awful is when you basically get feedback that uh, the manuscript doesn't work, it's unusable, it's unreadable, and you have to do a page one rewrite. And uh, the last uh, couple years ago, this happened to me twice in a row. So I worked, worked, worked on a manuscript and I turned it in to Sean, Leslie and Danielle. Uh, it didn't work. Page one rewrite. We spent a whole week together here in Nashville going over it and uh, figuring out what to fix. Uh, went away, wrote the next draft. 
turn that in as well. And that also uh, got thrown out by Sean. And so when if you've ever been in that in that space, especially if it's happened to you twice in a row, uh, you kind of fall into this pit of anguish and despair, right? Um, what can I do? What's going on here? Um, and especially for me, I had the overarching story, I, I had Sean uh, sign off on the overarching story. And I knew that worked, but yet the manuscripts I was turning in were unreadable, in his words. Uh, another phrase that he used was, Tim, you can't write a fucking sentence. And so we, I was in this place, and we were in this place at StoryGrid of trying to figure out what was going on here. What was, uh, what was wrong with, uh, if we knew the story, kind of overarching story was working, what was wrong? What was making our manuscripts unreadable? And we went back to where Story Grid started, which was um, Story the Story Grid, the book, the Story Grid, uh, and we call this now Story Grid 1.0. And this is really focused on the macro of your story, right? So we're looking at the manuscript level, the the four quadrants that make up the thing, the twenty skeletal scenes and sequences in your novel. It's really that big macro, overarching storytelling. And this is where Sean spent most of his time as a professional editor. You have to think about, uh, he was an editor at the major publishing houses. By the time a book hit his desk, uh, the writer kind of knew what they were doing. They had, the, they had the line by line working. What they were dealing with was problems at that manuscript level, at that macro level. And so that's what Sean had spent most of his time dealing with was that macro level of storytelling. That's what went into all his thoughts on genre and the five commandments and everything that you see inside of the story grid. But what we were running into, and we, we actually were running into this problem from two directions. So one was my writing, right? Um, I'm, I'm the, uh, another title I have inside a story grid besides CEO is um, uh, shock monkey, right? So anytime we're trying out something new at story grid, we try it out on me first as the writer. And this is what we kept seeing in my writing is the scenes weren't working. The line by line was not good. We are also seeing this from the publishing side. So for a short period of time, we were accepting manuscript submissions at StoryGrid, and we were having people really focus on making sure all the macro elements were working. And we were getting manuscripts, a lot of them, they were working at that macro level, but they were having the same problem I was having, which was this line-by-line -line scene work was unreadable. It didn't work. It was boring. It didn't make any sense. It didn't flow, like all of these things. And I, I wrote a couple of days ago in an email uh, that uh, I think it was yesterday um, I sent it to you where I talked about how I went I went back now to those manuscripts I turned in two years ago and I couldn't get through them either because the writing was so bad. And so what this meant was we were at this kind of crossroads at Story Grid is like, OK, well, what are we going to do now? Like, do we just keep focusing on the macro or do we need to figure out something new? And so this is where we started working on what we now call Story Grid 2.0. And this is where we're hyper-focused on the micro. How can we help writers with their scenes down to the tropes, down to the individual line-by-line -line writing of beats? Because this is the stuff that an editor can't fix. If, if you can't write a, a sentence that builds into a beat, that builds into a trope, that builds into a scene, then it doesn't matter if the macro stuff is working or not because nobody's ever going to get there. Nobody's ever going to finish reading the book. And so, and this was what I kept running into. And so we had to figure out a way to teach writers to consistently write great scenes. And Sean has actually said this from the beginning is like, if you want to practice, practice the scene level. That's where you can get really, really good at writing. But we didn't really have a systematic way to go about doing this. And that's what we're all about here at StoryGrid. We don't like soft things. We don't like uh, weak arguments. We don't like, you know, well, it was, you know, didn't kind of work for me. We like to do things in really scientific, specific ways where we can see um, improvement in structure. And so we went back into the lab. And what that looked like for us is that every week uh, I would get on a Zoom call with uh, Sean, uh, Leslie, and Danielle, and I would turn in my writing. So they would give me homework assignment, and uh, it was usually a scene. 
that I would have to write. Because at this point, <laughs> Sean had told me, you're no longer allowed to write anything longer than a scene because we can't just keep reading these horrible manuscripts and throwing them away. And so I would turn in my scene and then we would spend three hours uh, critiquing the scene. So at first they were talking a lot about theory and then we started getting into just critiquing my scenes to figure out what was wrong, how to talk about it and how to make it better. And I will tell you, uh, if you've listened to the podcast, you've heard some rough stuff. This was this wasn't even close to that. It was so much worse. Uh, there was one call where we spent an entire hour and we only got to the second word of the first sentence of my scene critiquing it. And it often went like this. It went like Sean would say, OK, I read your scene and he would talk for a while about everything he found wrong with it. And then Leslie would say, like, OK, yeah, you're right, Sean. All of those things are wrong, but we can't even get to those until Tim looks at these things. And she would list out all these things she found wrong in the scene. And then Danielle would say, well, yeah, both of you are right. But before we can even get to that stuff, we got to talk about all this other stuff that's wrong with the scene. Um, it was it was really rough. And they and what was hard about it was not just all the feedback they were giving me, but they were trying to figure out the right way to teach this, how to talk about it, the uh, new tools that needed to be, be developed. So it was like, I, again, I'm the shock monkey. And um, yeah, and some of the these are these are also ones we've never released publicly. So this isn't even things you've heard. And there were twice that I got so angry, I just logged off the call. And so but what we started seeing is that we were starting to make a little progress and then we had this breakthrough moment. Uh, and so I want to tell you about it now because it was really cool. Um, so we had this breakthrough moment where they um, they said, okay, instead of you trying to write your own like story from scratch, what we want you to do is read the first scene in this book called Beat the Reaper by, I think it's John Bazell or Brazel or something like that. But the book is called Beat the Reaper. They're like, all right, go read that that scene, that first scene, and then just write a scene like that, right? That was kind of the only direction I had was write a scene like that. I'm like, okay. So I go and um, I go and I write this scene and I turn it in and they're like, okay, this is working. Like this is, this is the best thing you've turned in since we started doing this. And we started talking through like, well, how does the story work? And why is it work so well? What, what were we able to do? And I real we realized like, oh, I wrote this story as if I was telling a friend at a bar what happened. So um, just a quick thing about the story. It's about a private uh, detective who uh, was running, who's running. The scene is he's running late uh, for his daughter's play at her school. He gets there late and then um, some stuff happens and all the shit hits the fan. OK, so uh, the, the scene I wrote. I wrote as if I was telling a friend about it at the bar, right? So um, I told it in this kind of bravado language, lots of cursing, lots of just like lewd stuff um, and just, and also writing it as if like I was the hero of the scene, even though I was obvious because it was in first person, I was obviously the fuck up. And we're like, okay, that's good. Now let's rewrite the scene. This is the homework I got. Rewrite the scene, but instead of telling a friend at a bar about it, we want you to write it as if you're telling your Catholic priest. Okay, same story. I have to tell the same story, but as if I'm telling my priest. Okay, well, that's that's a different type of story, right? Like, would not curse, uh, would not be so bravado, uh, would probably have a different um, a different outcome, maybe even you know you know you know you might shift it a little bit to be, be that way. I look cool to the priest instead of look cool to my buddy at the bar. So I did that. And then they're like, OK, now write it again, but as if you're telling your six year old daughter that was up on stage when all of this was happening. So, again, you've got to change the language. You've got to change the point that you're trying to make. You've got to change the way in this case, um, the way that uh, I talked about my ex-wife in the story changes depending on who I'm talking it to. Right. If I'm telling my friend at the bar, it's like, yeah, my bitch of an ex-wife. If I'm telling my daughter, I'm going to use different language. Same thing with the priest. Right. And this is what clicked is that we all know how to do this, right? We do this all the time, right? Whenever we're telling a story to somebody in our life, we start shifting the story based on who we're telling the story to, why we're telling the story, the point we're trying to get across. 
it changes depending on who we're talking to and um, how we're trying to uh, how we're trying to portray the story. This also changes the type of language you use. It changes the details that you put in the story, the details that you leave out of the story. All of that changes as you start to wrap your mind around this. And this was our first tool that we started figuring out. And this became a series of breakthroughs that really helped us learn how to teach writing at this line by line level. And so everything I'm going to teach you today has come out of that training. Now, there's all kinds of stuff to it that obviously I can't get into in one little 45 minute hour long training, but we're going to get into the tools that have been the most helpful to me, the five mistakes that I promised to share. Now, normally when something, when I was starting to put together this training, I was like, okay, I'm going to share the mistakes and then I'm going to share the tools we, we did to fix the mistakes. And I realized that's actually not the, the way to do this. So I'm going to share with you first the tools and how we use them. And then I'm going to show you the mistakes that those fix in your writing. And I think you'll, you'll see how they help that stuff. So let's just go ahead and start with tool number one. All right. So we want to write a book. We're writers and we are the artist. Okay. So we, as the artist are the full complex person that each of us are, right? We play all kinds of roles in our life. Maybe you're a parent, you're a spouse, you're a friend, you're a worker, you're a writer. Like you are, you are a very complex person, right? If you think about like Jungian archetypes inside of you, right? You're this package of all of these things. And you as the artist want to create a work of art that readers will enjoy. And hopefully thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of readers will enjoy our writing. This is our goal, right? We want to create a work of art that readers enjoy. But the way that if you try to write a book from that point of view, it's just too much. This is where we start getting into trouble where we're like, okay, well, you know, what do I put in the book? You know, what am I, who am I trying to talk to? And then you hear something like Sean says all the time, um, specificity breeds universality. And it's like, okay, what does that mean? How do we actually put this uh, into practice? And so what we've realized is like, okay, me, the artist, which is the full complex person that I am, needs to hire one version of myself to tell a story. Right. So we're going to just take one archetype, one character inside of myself, and that's going to be the person that tells the story. So in this example I'm using, we're going to say it's a grandfather. Okay. I'm not a grandfather yet, much too young to be a grandfather, but um, that is an archetype. I could pretend to be a grandfather, right? Like I could put myself into that case if I wanted to write from this idea. So we're going to say the artist is hiring a specific archetype called a grandfather. And then now on the other side of the table, we don't want to tell, try to tell a story to some vague audience of thousands of people. We want to tell a story to one person. And at StoryGrid, we call this SAM, and that stands for Single Audience Member. So when we're telling a story inside of StoryGrid, we have one very specific person called an author telling a story to one very specific person called SAM. And she is the person we're telling the story to, our single audience member. So again, in my example here, we're going to say this is a grandchild. So we have a grandfather, and he is telling a story to his grandchild. Well, why is he telling a story to his grandchild? Well, we could say things like he wants, you know, it could be a bedtime story. He wants to entertain his child and all of those. But he also wants to help his grandchild know how to make a good decision. And so... He's going to tell a story that's about asking this question, when do you stay home and stay safe? And when do you leave home and risk danger, right? For a child, for all of us, but especially for a child that's growing up, this is a really important question, right? Because there are times that you need to stay safe and there's times where you need to set out on adventure and take risk. And this is something that a grandfather who has a lot of experience can help a child start forming how to make this decision. And these kind of questions inside of StoryGrid are what we call double factor problems. A double factor problem is not a, a problem that has a clear answer. And these are most of the problems we deal with in, in, in our life, right? If I say, if I did say to you, hey, I have a problem. I've got, you know, I have too many chapsticks on my desk, but I got 
two chapsticks here and I got two chapsticks here. How many chapsticks do I have? I, I can't figure it out. It's like, well, you do two plus two, you got four, right? Like that's not a double factor problem. A double factor problem is one that the answer is, well, it depends, right? It's context specific. Depending on the context in your life and what's going on around you, you might do something different. That's what a double factor problem is. So asking that question, when do you stay home and stay safe? And when do you leave home and risk danger? That is a double factor problem because the answer is, well, it depends on your life and what's going on with you. And so a story that we might read to help this is The Hobbit. So if you read through The Hobbit, you see this is like a grandfather telling their grandchild a story. And it's talking about this idea of when do you stay home and stay safe? And when do you leave home and risk danger? So think about if you've read The Hobbit, think about the language that's used. There's no cursing. There's even a point in the book where um, J.R.R. Tolkien steps out and he's like, hey, don't worry, Bilbo's going to be okay, right? So when you start reading, you're seeing, oh, this is how he makes his language choices. This is how he makes choices about the details in his book. This is how he makes all kinds of choices because he, J.R.R. Tolkien, who is a very complex being, he can be a friend, he, was, he fought in a war, he's a writer. In this case... He is acting as a grandfather, telling his grandchild a story, okay? So let's look at another example. So we're going to do the same thing. We have the artist, we have the reader, and then the artist is going to hire an author. In this case, it's a woman to tell a story to Sam, a younger woman, right? And we're going to tell a story. And we're going to tell a story that's asking this question, when and to whom? Should a young woman cede her agency? Again, that's a double factor problem because there's sometimes that, I mean, this is women and men. You have to figure out who am I going to trust? I don't know how to do everything. So should I cede my agency to this person or should I keep agency to myself? This is that double factor problem. And this is a double factor problem we learn about if we read Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. And what you see is it's as if. Charlotte, is as, it's as if Jane Eyre, 10 years after what happened in the book, is telling a story to a young woman in need of a mentor. So again, now if you go back and read Jane Eyre and you look at it through this lens, you can see like, oh, this is, this is like a mentor helping a younger woman figure out when she should cede her agency and when she should keep it for herself. So now if we back up and look at this tool, this is what we call the narrative device at StoryGrid. This is the tool that we use to, fi to fix two of the most common mistakes that we see in scene writing, is to get extremely specific on who is telling the story, extremely specific on the person they're telling the story to, and the problem that they're trying to help Sam figure out a an answer to. And it's always a double factor problem, which means it's context dependent, which means there's no clear you should do this or that. You tell a story to help Sam make a good decision. So now let's look at our first two common scene writing mistakes that we see at StoryGrid by reviewing manuscripts, looking at scene, uh, scenes that people are writing in our program, scenes people are submitting to us. And the first one is info dumping, right? So in an effort to ensure that the reader understands what is happening. We spend paragraph after paragraph just like shooting information at them. Whether it's world bu building, character backgrounds, descriptions of obscure facts, or any other information you think is important, you just dump it all in at once. But if we think about telling a story to somebody, we would never do that to somebody. Again, think about if you're out with a friend at a coffee shop and you were telling them a story, the first thing you wouldn't do is just give them lists and lists and lists of background facts so that they're not, quote, lost in the story, right? We would never do that. And yet that's what we do when we sit down and write because we're so worried about making sure the reader understands what's going on. But if we keep in mind that we're trying to tell a story that is interesting and exciting for our single audience member, for Sam, for that person sitting across the table from you, you won't info dump on them. You will get right into the story and give them the bare minimum of facts they need to not be lost and just start telling the story. 
So Sean says all the time, like, you have to understand, like, readers can keep up. They're smarter than you think. You don't have to over explain things, but it can be hard to know what to do. But again, if I was just telling you a story across the table, I would give you the bare minimum amount of information so that I can keep the story moving and keep it interesting and exciting for you. So we have to keep it interesting and exciting for Sam. So if you use the narrative device when you're writing, and this is what I'm doing in my writing that's made a, a huge difference, is I'm always thinking, okay, I'm telling this story to a single audience member. They're going to get bored and walk away at the first possible opportunity. So I cannot just dump info on them. This is also how you figure out what details to put in the story and what details not to put in the story. So in some way, these can be similar, right? Info dumping and unnecessary details. But the unnecessary details is another thing is you're telling Sam, this one person that you're writing the story for, just enough information, right? This And this is where every, this is the number one mistake that we see that's hard to identify um, is making sure you put the right details in at the right time and you're not just dumping tons of details that they don't need to know. So if you're super clear on Sam, this will make a big difference. So I'm going to use the example of my own book that um, I just finished a draft for that um, thankfully Leslie has read a lot of and uh, likes my writing. It's not going to get thrown out. Um, and at one point uh, I put in, it's told in first person and I put in the uh, how old the, my children were, right? The character's children were. And, and Leslie uh, read it and she was like, okay, but tell me again about the author's relationship with Sam. I go, well, this is the first time they met. Um, this is the first time they met and he's telling the story. She's like, okay, because if they had a pre-existing relationship where Sam knew the kids, um, how old the kids were, you can't just tell them, you got to slip it in another way, right? So again, thinking about that, think if you went out with one of your best friends uh, for coffee and you were telling them a story about your kids, you wouldn't stop and say, Oh, my son, you know, my son, Craig, he is eight years old. Your friend would be like, yeah, I know. Why are you telling me that? Right. So this is where like being super clear on who your Sam is, your and the author's relationship with Sam helps you figure out what details to put in and which details to leave out, which ones you can, you have to subtly get in, which ones you can just be forthright with. This makes a huge difference. So using our narrative device of the author, Sam, and double factor problem help you with the info dumping and unnecessary details, all right? So let's look at tool number two. So this one, if you've been around uh, StoryGrid for any length of time, you've, uh, you've seen this. This is the five commandments of storytelling. So we've talked about this a lot. There's tons of information on the website. It's in the book. So I'm just going to go over this quickly. So the five commandments of storytelling is the inciting incident. So this is the ball of chaos that comes into your protagonist's life and knocks their life off balance. Then you have this series of progressive complications that lead to a turning point. And the turning point is when the protagonist realizes they can never go back to the way things were. Right. So up until that point, what they're trying to do is just get things back to the way things were before the inciting incident. And at this point, they know they can't go back. OK, and that pushes them into this crisis moment. And the crisis is always uh, two options. So you have to do A or B. It's a binary option. So they they reach this point where they're going to they have to go through door A or door B. And the climax is when they make the decision, when they actually take the action of making the decision of what they're going to do. And then the resolution is what happens as a result of their decision. Okay, so that's a really quick overview. If you're not familiar with these, um, just run, uh, just go to the website. There's stuff there. We have a little course on it too. Um, but these are the five commandments of storytelling. And what we see when we're looking at scenes is that one of the biggest mistakes people make is not putting all five commandments in there. And I should be able to read your scene and easily identify the inciting incident, the turning point, the crisis, the climax, and the resolution, 
This is what we see over and over when we're reading scenes is we can't find this stuff. And really what this means is nothing has actually changed in your scene. Nothing has moved forward. The five commandments are not, um, they're not a formula in the way of like it's formulaic. Their formula in the way that like e equals MC squared is a formula. E equals MC squared um, is just a description of reality. So in a story, you have to have change in your story for it to actually be a story. That's what stories are. It's about change. And the five commandments is how you create change. So if you're missing one of those commandments, your scene is not working. And these commandments work from the manuscript level all the way down to the beat level. But we're specifically looking at a scene this is what we see is that we can't find the inciting incident. We can't identify the climax. We can't identify the resolution. So a scene has to have all five commandments. Otherwise, it's not working. So tool number two is the five commandments. But we're going to dig into that a little bit more here. So in order to get to tool number three, I want to get us all on the same page on a couple of things. So we looked at those five commandments. Let's look at this inciting incident. So one of the ways, one of the definitions of our inciting incident is it's a ball of chaos that spins into the story and knocks the protagonist's life out of balance. Now, this can be a good and a bad thing, right? So a lot of times we think of this as a negative thing where like, you know, maybe you're walking down the street and you get hit in the head with a bat, right? But this can also be a good thing. It could be like, hey, I'm living my life. Everything's going fine. And then I get a job offer. And now my life is knocked out of balance and I have to figure out what to do, right? So what we're seeing here is at the beginning of the scene, your, your protagonist's life is going in a way that they, um, that they, it would be normal for them to keep going. And some sort of ball of chaos comes and hits them and knocks their life off balance. So it happens to your protagonist. It comes from somewhere outside of them, whether it's another character, the setting, the numinous, whatever it is, okay? So that's the first thing that happens is the inciting incident, okay? Then we look at the climax. So remember the climax is what the protagonist decides to do as a result of the inciting incident. So obviously we have progressive complications and we have uh, the crisis that happens, but ultimately the inciting incident knocked their life off balance and now they have to make a decision about what to do. They are responding to that, okay? Are we all on the same page here? We, we feeling good about that? We understanding what's happening? All right, I'm seeing nods. All right, good. So now we can talk about tool number three. This was a game changer for me. And this is one of those that when I tell writers, when I explain this to them and they get it, they're like, holy shit, that changes everything for me. So I love this one. This is one of my favorite ones. Really helped me understand so many of the mistakes in my own writing. Okay, so... The inciting incident happens, and then that forces our character to make a decision at the climax, right? So what another way we could say this is there's a stimulus and a response. So there's a stimulus to our protagonist, and then they respond to that stimulus. This is the way stories work. Another way to say that is there's an input and an output. So something comes into our protagonist's life. And then they output it. Then they output by reacting to it. Okay. So this is the biggest mistake we see on a line by line, beat by beat level is that people have the protagonist being the inciting incident, the protagonist inciting the characters, inciting the world, inciting things around them. This is the big mistake is that we is that the protagonist is the one causing chaos in other people's lives instead of reacting to chaos coming into their life the protagonist has to be the outputter the protagonist has to be the responder by a long margin it should be this like 90 95% of the time and most of the things going on the protagonist of your scene should be responding to things that's happening that's what the five commandments say right so the protagonist has to be the outputter. They have to be the one responding. And what we see when we're looking at scenes is that people want the protagonist to be in control. So they're the ones causing change. They should be reacting to the change. So if you switch those two around, it makes a big difference. So let me just give you 
two examples from Masterworks. So we're going to look at Pride and Prejudice first. This is the first scene of, this is the first part of the first scene of Pride and Prejudice. Um, in this scene, Mr. Bennett is the protagonist. So in this particular scene, of course, um, it's, um, is it Elizabeth? Oh my gosh, I cannot believe I just forgot the name of the main character in Pride and Prejudice. Anyway, she is not the protagonist of this scene. Every, oh, I see you guys typing. You're giving it to me. I know. All right. Um, in the first scene, Mr. Bennett is the protagonist. Okay. So I'm just going to read through this really quickly here. It's on your screen if you want to follow along. My dear Mr. Bennett, said his lady to him one day, have you heard that Netherfield Park is let at last? Mr. Bennett replied that he had not. But it is, returned she, for Mrs. Long has just been here and she told me all about it. Mr. Bennett made no answer. Do you not want to know who has taken it, cried his wife impatiently? You want to tell me and I have no objection to hearing it. <laughs> I just love this. Um, this was invitation enough. Why, my dear, you must know, Mrs. Long says that Netherfield is taken by a young man of large fortune from the north of England. That he came down on Monday in a chase and four to see the place and was so much delighted with it that he agreed with Mr. Morris immediately that he is to take possession before Michaelmas. I don't know. And some of his servants are to be in the house by the end of next week. What is his name? Okay. What would Mr. Bennett have been doing is if, if his wife hadn't have come to him and said, have you heard about Netherfield Park? He would keep living his life. He'd keep going for a walk looking at the garden, whatever it is Mr. Bennett's come doing, he would have kept doing that. But instead, a ball of chaos called his wife came into his life and knocked it off balance. And so what you see here is Mr. Bennett is the protagonist of this scene, and he is constantly being forced to respond to what's coming at him in the form of his wife. So this is what it looks like to have the protagonist be the outputter. This is really important because this is how you get people to empathize with your protagonist. When you're, this is the reason why people empathize with your protagonist with this is because they're wondering what they're going to do. They're wondering, well, how are they going to react? What are they going to do? This is what I would do if something like this happened. What is this person going to do? If you put your protagonist in the inputter seat, the, per, the reader can't figure out who they're supposed to empathize with and who they're supposed to care about. They need to care about your protagonist. So your protagonist has to be the one that's having their life knocked off balance. So let's look at another example. This is in The Hobbit. This is from the first scene of The Hobbit. All that the unsuspecting Bilbo, Bilbo saw that morning was an old man with a staff. He had a tall pointed blue hat, a long gray cloak, a silver scarf over which a white beard hung down below his waist in immense black boots. Good morning, said Bilbo, and he meant it. The sun was shining and the grass was very green. But Gandalf looked at him from under long bushy eyebrows that stuck out further than the brim of his shady hat. What do you mean? He said. Do you wish me a good morning or mean that it is a good morning whether I want not or that you feel good this morning or that it is morning to be good on? All of them at once, said Bilbo. In a very fine morning for a pipe of tobacco out of doors into the bargain. If you have a pipe about you, sit down and have a fill of mine. There's no hurry. We have all the day before us. Then Bilbo sat down on a seat by his door, crossed his legs, and blew out a beautiful gray ring of smoke that sailed up into the air without breaking and floated away over the hill. So again, what would Bilbo have been doing if Gandalf didn't come along? He would have just sat there on his stoop, smoking his pipe, enjoying the morning. But this man comes along. Bilbo responds by saying good morning. Gandalf asks a question. He answers again. And before you know it, Bilbo is forced to invite a bunch of dwarves into his house for a meal. And he ends up fighting a dragon or facing a dragon, right? So what happens in this is that Bilbo's life was going in one direction. And then something comes in and knocks him off balance. So again, Bilbo is in that outputter seat. So this is what this tool of making sure your protagonist is the outputter. They are the one responding to things beat by beat, scene by scene through your story. So this is the fourth mistake we see is putting the protagonist in the inputter seat. 
This causes your reader to not know who they're supposed to be following, not empathize with the right characters. Often they empathize with the antagonist because they're the one that they, they're trying to see what they're going to do as a response. The other thing that this helps you with is making sure that your protagonist has a single object of desire. So in your story, in each scene, your protagonist should have one object of desire they're trying to get to. And it is in response to the inciting incident. So they're trying to get back to the way things were. They're trying to go after one particular thing. And if you have too many of these, or I read your story and I can't figure out what the, um, what the uh, protagonist wants, that's a major problem. So this week I've been going back through uh, The Hobbit and The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, and it is amazing. It is in every single scene what Dorothy wants. It's in there over and over and over. You know what Dorothy wants. She wants to go home, and it's mentioned in every single scene in some way. So you have to have a clear object of desire. I should be able to pick out any scene from your, if you have 80 scenes in your book, and I just pick out scene 33 and I read it, I should know what your protagonist wants in that scene. I should be able to come down to one thing your protagonist is, uh, is after. And what we see so many times and so many of the scenes we're looking at is that we either can't figure out what the object of desire is, or it's, too, it's more than one thing. It's multiple things and it's jumping around. Again, this is what causes lots of confusion for your readers. So these are the five common scene mistakes that we see over and over and over when we're reviewing scenes. These are the top five things that we see. Info dumping, unnecessary details, missing commandments, so it doesn't have all, the all five commandments. We have the protagonist in the inputter seat instead of the outputter seat where they're supposed to be. And the protagonist has too many or unclear objects of desire. And the three story grid tools that we use to combat these are first the narrative device this for me is was the biggest game changer i come back to it all the time whenever i'm writing a scene i make sure i understand what's happening here the author is helping sam with a double factor problem and everything in that scene has to be relevant to all three of those things then we have to have the five commandments the inciting incident, the turning point progressive complication, the crisis, the climax, and the resolution. And then we have to have the protagonist as the outputter. The protagonist must be the one responding to things coming into their world. This is how the reader knows how to map onto the right person and care about the right person. All right. So I want to pause here. I've got more to share. We're going to do a Q&A, but I've been rolling now for like 43 minutes. So I just want to hear from you. Um, has this been helpful so far? Have you have you found this helpful? Just drop in the chat here. I'm, I'm now looking at the chat. Oh, wow. Okay. Lots of Janine says yes. Neela says yes. Rob says yes. I see yes, yes, um, lots of yes, a little bit of confusion there. I understand that. Good review, very helpful. Yes, makes complete sense. All right, all right. So um, I would also love to hear, like, um, put in the chat, like, what's one of the one thing I shared today that stood out to you that you think is going to help your writing? Go ahead and just drop that in next, and I'll just read a few of them. There's uh, 260 people here, so I'm not I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. All right, David says the input output. Awesome. Ryan says Sam. Sherry, the narrative device. Emily, object of desire. Um, Matt says protagonist as the out protagonist as the outputter is a game changer. Yeah, that's one of those. Now go back and read one of your favorite masterworks, one of your favorite novels, and just look for it and you'll see it happening constantly. Um, narrative device. Uh yeah. Janine says, thinking about the specific of who I'm telling the story to. Yeah, that's a huge thing. Reminder of Sam, who reacts to action. Um, yeah, outputting protagonist, tool number three. Let's see. Yeah, lots of people talking about Sam, narrative device. Uh, yeah, too many unclear objects of desire. This also, obviously, these all help each other. That will help you putting the wrong details in too. 
because um, I, I reviewed a scene uh, a couple of weeks ago that was submitted to us and I went through and I'm like, I can't figure out the objects of desire. And also there's so much rambling detail in this scene. I don't, and the, because the writer wasn't sure what the protagonist wanted, they just kept throwing more information in the scene. Anyway, I could go on and on about this. Uh, fantastic. Yeah, I love the examples. Um, I asked myself about handling exceptions. Yeah, I'm sure you'll have, I saw some things popping up out of the corner of my eyes. Like, is it always like this? Are there exceptions? Happy to go over that. We'll get to that in the Q and A. Um, okay, so I'm gonna jump ahead here and keep going because at this point, what's next, right? Because um, we went over the five most common mis scene writing mistakes. I went over these uh, with Danielle, our chief academic officer to see what she's seeing. These are the five that we identified. But these are not the only scene writing mistakes, right? We have a whole rubric we look through here at StoryGrid. And other mistakes look like the scene starting too early. No value shift in the scene. So nothing shifts on the value spectrum in your scene. Expectations change too much from the beginning to the end of the scene. Unclear object of desire for the other characters in the scene, right? All the characters have to have their object of desire. And if it's unclear what those are, it's going to be confusing inconsistent behavior for protagonists and other characters, attuned dialogue exchanges. So this is where, um, this is a really good example of what people mean when they say shoe leather. Uh, so uh, people are like, hey, you know, you got to get all the shoe leather out of your scene. And other thing, there's other great quotes like, um, well, it's easy to edit. You just cut out the boring stuff. And it's like, what does that mean? Well, the boring stuff would be, um, you never, if you're watching a TV show and somebody makes a phone call, you never see the part where they're like, Hey, what's up? And they're like, not much. How's your day? Good. How about you? Pretty good. Right. Those are all like attuned. Like there's no conflict there. There has to be conflict within beats. And so one of the things we see a lot is dialogue exchanges where they're just doing that kind of stuff. So uh, attuned dialogue exchanges are a problem. The protagonist is too competent. They shouldn't be too competent too early in the story. Um, the setting's not developed. We have some others, but these are the main ones. It's all I could fit on my slide. Uh, so these are also common scene writing mistakes we see over and over and over. Now we have lots of tools in StoryGrid uh, to deal with this. So I shared with you the three, uh, three of my favorite story grid tools, but we have lots of others that we teach. We have the five leaf genre clover. We have the proposition of possibility, which is the premise for your story or your scene, uh, the point of view, event synthesis analysis, the four questions we use to ana analyze a scene, figuring out the tropes and beats inside a scene, showing the action instead of telling with exposition, right? Show with action instead of tell with exposition. There's three different categories of beats that we go over. We talk about how to miss a tune beat. So there's always conflict beat to beat. So there never gets boring. Uh, how to valence your language. This is really important. This goes back uh, to the narrative device thing, uh, which is like, um, if I'm talking to my buddy in, uh, in the bar, I might say, hey, my fucking ex-wife. If I talk to uh, my daughter, I'd say, oh, your mommy, right? So these are completely different valences of language, depending on what you're talking, who you're talking to, different energy sources that can come at your protagonist, and then a framework for writing, engaging exposition, right? So this is the part we're always afraid of when we think about things like info dumping or too many details is, well, we have to have exposition. We have to tell what's going on. How do we do that and keep it engaging and keep the story moving at a fast enough pace to keep Sam paying attention? And then whenever something comes in, whenever a ball of chaos comes into your uh, character's life or your protagonist's life, there's seven different ways that they can react. So these are a bunch of other tools that we have developed inside of StoryGrid to really help with uh, figuring out how to fix all of those problems that we run into. And when I start thinking about this stuff, like, um, you know, we've, we've really focused on this idea. Of we want writers to figure out how to write great scenes. This is really, really important because if they don't write, if you can't write a great scene, nobody's ever going to finish your book, right? So what happens if you don't fix this? Like, this is what I was running into with my own writing is like, well, what happens if I don't, I got to fix this, right? Because the first thing that happens is readers won't stick with your story, 
right? So you might have the perfect ending climax for your story. You might have a beautiful speech in praise of the villain. You might have all these amazing set pieces in your story. But if you're not writing scenes that are compelling and pulling readers to read all the way to the end, they're never going to stick with your story long enough to get there. Trust me, when I went back and read those drafts, I'm like, I would feel bad for anybody that would have to read these first three scenes that I read. They were never going to get through it. Right. And that's the next thing is readers won't make it through three scenes, much less the entire book. But it's not just about this particular story. Right. You'll never write that book that people love so much. They'll tell other people about it. This is what I want to do. I want to write a book that people love so much. They'll tell their friends to read it. And even more so, uh, readers will never get to hear your voice and your message. They'll miss out on the joy of experiencing your story. And so we have developed, we've taken all this stuff we've learned about how to teach, uh, how to teach writers, how to write great scenes. And we put it into our class, the Masterwork Scene Writing Course. So this is the course that we put together to help you learn how to write scenes that are so good, readers can't help but keep turning pages. This is a 16 week course. And our next semester begins in a little less than two weeks on July 2nd. And so I want to tell you a little bit about how this course works, how you can join, and then we'll do the Q&A and I'll stay on and answer as many questions as I possibly can. So like I said, we took everything that we learned when you know the four of us were in the lab using me as the shock monkey, and then we ran a pilot program and we took a bunch of people through the program, fixed a bunch of stuff, started teaching it some more, and we've really solidified it into this masterwork scene writing course where we teach you all of those tools all of the different ways to understand how to write a great scene in this 16-week course so it's broken up into four parts the first part is the first uh, five weeks and this is where you learn how to do scene analysis and planning out your scenes so we use things like the five leaf genre clover the proposition of possibility the narrative device which i introduced you to today figuring out the right point of view, the five commandments, the event synthesis analysis, identifying tropes and beats. So this is a lot of stuff. But what we found is, and just like when we go all the way back uh, to when we had our first breakthrough was when I stopped trying to just come up with stuff out of thin air and instead focused on a masterwork scene and writing something like that. That's when things started working for me. So this is what we do inside a story grid. The first five weeks in this um, in this semester, we're going to look at Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. We're going to look at the lovers meet scene and we're going to uh, analyze it and see how it works through all of these different lenses and break it down and then plan how you can write a scene that maps onto that. This is how you're going to level up your writing. And then the next uh, the next five weeks, we get into how to write engaging action. Right. So we start looking at the different types of beats that convey action. We're going to talk about how to valence your language and how that plays a huge role in keeping the action engaging for your Sam. Again, it always comes back to Sam and the critical role that misattunement plays in your line by line writing. This was a this is one of those things I use as I'm writing. Right. So it's often I'll write, for instance, if I'm writing dialogue, I'll write a line of dialogue and I go to write the next line. I'm like, wait a second. Is this a tune? Like, is there any conflict in here? And if I can't find any conflict in what I was about to write, uh, which is the protagonist part, right? Because they would be outputting. I either create conflict or I just delete that line of dialogue and just start at the next one, right? And so this is stuff, once you get it into your head of learning how to do this, it just keeps your writing snappy as you're writing. It is significantly reduce the amount of my uh, rewrites because I'm do I've learned this stuff enough that I can do it as I go. All right. And then uh, we talk about the sources of energy that drive action in your story that both come from internal to the characters and external as well. So then the next four weeks, we look at character development. So we look at how to effectively reveal your character's uh, true nature through action instead of exposition. This is really important. We look at the three categories of breakdown beats. This is really cool. So there was actually a breakdown beat in that Pride and Prejudice scene. So when he doesn't respond, when she inputs and he just stays quiet, he's freezing, right? So there's three different types of breakdown beats, how to miss a tune a beat um, between characters, the how to look at freeze, flight, and fight, 
um, and the seven ways a character can react to misattunement in their environment, right? So there's seven categories of reaction that we can do. And then finally, the last 14 to 16 weeks, we went through action, then we went through character development, and now we figure out how to put exposition in our story, right? This is the last thing we look at, is how to fill in the gaps with exposition, right? So how can we create exposition that's engaging for readers? That's not info dumping. That's not just putting details on them they, they don't care about. Again, we address info dumping directly. Uh, the three functions of exposition. So whenever you're writing exposition, it should be accomplishing one of three things and how to connect the exposition in your scenes to the global concepts for your entire story. So that's what we cover over 16 weeks. So it's a lot, but it's really cool. You also start out with writing one draft and then you go through and do iteration of homework. I'm gonna get into that in a little bit, what that looks like. And then you write another draft at the end, you get to compare. And what this is my favorite part, is when students do all of the homework and they compare to what they wrote 16 weeks ago to the end and it's always night and day. So your trainers for this, um, so Sean Coyne, like I mentioned at the beginning, he is the founder of Creator and Story Grid. Everything inside this program has come from his narrative theory and his 30 plus years of experience. Um, and he uh, comes to something I'll talk about in a minute. And then uh, you'll hear from Danielle and Leslie. They do the training each week that you're going to receive. So in this program, um, how it works is every Sunday, you'll receive new writing instruction that covers that week's topic. So this will include examples from the masterwork, how to's and next step for your own personal practice. And then you'll get your own weekly worksheet. So this is where you start putting the stuff into practice um, so that you can actually apply this to your writing. So a couple of the weeks you're writing drafts, the other ones you're going through specific exercises so you can put this stuff into practice. This is one of our favorite things about this class is it allows you to iterate quickly, right? So if you're practicing writing a draft of a novel, that's really hard, right? Like you can't do that over and over and over where when you're looking at the scene level and even just practicing little bits inside of the scene, you can practice over and over and get better. So this is where each week we give you a worksheet. And then you have the monthly instructor Q and A. So this is where Danielle comes on and answers your questions throughout uh, the semester. And then each month we do a Q and A with Sean Coyne as well, where you can come on and he usually does some teaching and then he comes, uh, he answers some questions as well. And then you'll get access. We put everybody in each semester into their own cohort inside a Slack channel. Uh, and this is where you can interact with other members, discuss the week, uh, the weekly work and practice together and learn more about it. Now, we've been doing this now uh, for a while, running this program. Uh, we've been through several semesters uh, now doing this. And so we went back to some of our students to just get their feedback on it. Um, and we've got lots of great testimonials. I'll show you some more of those uh, where you can read some more of those in a minute, but I just want to share some with you. So Pam said, this material isn't talked about anywhere else. And this is one of my favorite ones because when I found StoryGrid, it was because I had gone through classes out there. I'd read books, I'd listened to podcasts and Sean was talking about this stuff in a way that was completely different um, than I was hearing anywhere else that actually made concrete sense and helped me become a better writer. Kathy said, I've learned so much from this course that has improved my writing. Christy says, I always tell anyone and everyone to join. Uh, Bill, who I saw, Bill, you're on this call or were earlier, I saw your name pop up. You said at one point, this will become the required basics for every writer in the future. And of course, we agree with that at StoryGrid. Shelly said, if you really want to learn how to write, really, then this is the way to go. Uh, and then S.E. McKee says, I would recommend this to all writers out there that want to be proud of their work. John said, one of a kind, deep diving learning you can't get anywhere else. And finally, Linda said, the best way to analyze stories in a practical, useful way while still keeping the process creative. And so this is what we're doing inside of the master scene writing course. So our goal is to help you learn to, to learn to write scenes that are so good, readers can't help but keep turning pages. So there's a new class that's starting uh, July 2nd. So in about a week and a half, if you want to join, it's $960 for the semester or it's $265 a month for four months. And you can see that right now if you go to scenecourse.com. So I'm going to put that in the chat here just so everybody can get there. 
If you go to scenecourse.com, it's going to uh, redirect you to the information page about the course. There's more information. There's the mistakes at the top, but there's more information about uh, what the course entails, uh, what uh, each week looks like, more information about your trainers, um, and uh, more testimonials there, along with some video testimonials as well. So I highly recommend you go now to scenecourse.com. Check that out. And you can go ahead and join us because we're going to get started on July second okay so we're right at the top of the hour so that leaves 30 minutes for q a so i'm happy to stay on up to 30 minutes uh for some q a um again while we're waiting here i highly recommend you go to scenecourse.com and check that out but i'm happy to start working through questions now as i was i was kind of like glancing at the chat right here on my screen as we were uh as i was talking and i saw some questions going in there I don't want to try to scroll through everything and catch those questions. So if you asked a question earlier, you might want to like copy and paste that in and repost it because I'm just going to start answering from right now. But um, I'm happy to answer any questions about anything, anything about what I taught today, about my own writing, what I learned in StoryGrid, the Masterwork Scene Writing Course, um, anything around storytelling. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it um, from my perspective as the CEO of StoryGrid and a writer. All right, let's see what you got here. Uh, is the course in American funds? Yes, it is. That is American USD. Um, Ron says, is the Story Grid Guild being phased out in this in its place? No, this actually dovetails into the guild. Um, but if you're a guild member now, nothing's going to change on that at all. Janine says, uh, question, I'm a baby writer uh, writing my first book only six months in, but I'm wondering if it is common to feel like I can make my work so much better every time I reread it. I have such a hard time connecting to my own writing. And every time I reread it, I don't like it. Yeah. So this is, that's a super common thing. Um, especially when you're starting out, um, you saw all those lists of like mistakes that we look for in writing. And it's really hard to not make those mistakes in your writing when you're starting out. Uh, so that is totally normal. Um, what I have found is like, usually what I'm trying to do is get really good at one thing that I want to do. Like, I want to just write really great dialogue on this scene. Um, there was one scene in particular. So in the book, uh, in the book I finished, um, there was a couple of scenes where there were fights between the husband and wife. And I'm like, okay, I know what it's like to fight with a spouse. Um, I want to nail those. Like, so I just want the dialogue between them to be really, really true. And so when I wrote those, that is what I hyper-focused on. And what you'll see is you'll get better and better at things where you basically, it's just like anything else, like, um, like driving, right? So my son is almost 15. Uh, I've taught him some stuff with driving. And it's like the first time you hit a brake, everybody like doesn't let up. And so it like slams you forward, right? But now that you're, you've been driving for years and years, you hit the brake and it stops nicely and you never even think about it, right? Same thing with steering, same thing with checking your blind spot. These are all things you had to do consciously that now you don't have to do consciously anymore. And I found that writing great scenes works the same way is that you hyper focus on something, you get good enough at it that you start doing it automatically and you focus on the next thing. Kevin says, can you use these techniques for short stories too? Absolutely. In fact, we did this on the podcast last year where um, we uh, we worked through a short story. So um, the biggest thing is trying to get something about 1,500 to 2,500 words um, really nailed one good instance of the five commandments. So not like a novella because that would be multiple scenes. This is focused on one scene or one short story. Can you give real fiction examples of the double factor thing? Well, I gave two, right? So The Hobbit was when do we stay home and stay safe? And then when do we go out and risk? Uh, and then the Jane Eyre one was another example of when does a young woman seed her agency and when does she keep it for herself? Um, I don't have any more off the top of my head. We've done several uh, inside of StoryGrid. We've talked there. We did one on the podcast through the Ed McBain story. Um, but uh, so those those are examples that I gave in this particular presentation. Uh, yeah. 
So how to avoid excessive telling rather than showing. So, um, you know, Danielle and Leslie get deep into this inside of the program, um, but I'll just talk about it from my perspective. So one of the things is that you realize, um, so this was a big breakthrough for me uh, when Sean and I were talking about this one day, is he's like, you know, you don't know what other people are thinking, right? Like even your, if you, you know, I've been married 20 years and uh, I still don't really know what she's thinking. Like I can't crack open her head and see all her motivations, what she's doing, why she's doing it. I can't see her worldview. All I can see is what she does. And then I infer all of the other stuff from that. And so what I've started doing with my writing is I just want to show the characters in motion doing things and letting the reader infer what I mean by those, because that's all we do anyway. And so if I start trying to tell the reader why my characters are doing what they're doing and why they believe this and what they believe and all of that, that is not how real life works. Real life works by I watch somebody's actions and I try to figure out what's true. This is even, this goes to what people say, right? It's like, um, you know, you like when people lie, you know, you don't always know when people are lying and you're always kind of wondering, are people telling me the truth, right? The whole truth. And so you can always just take the action and try to infer what people are doing. So I force my reader to do that too, by showing them the action of my characters and they can infer what I mean. And this is why, this is how you make a story universal. This is why um, if three people read the same story, they'll come away with three different messages, right? Um, because you're reading, you're co-creating by in ingesting a story. But the way that happens is by being super specific, right? This comes back to author and Sam and the double factor problem is that you have to know as the writer who is telling the story, who they're telling it to and why they're telling it. But anyway, that's how I get away from doing too much telling is um, I try to say as little as possible directly to the reader and just show what my characters are doing. Um, yeah, so the uh, the class, the Masterwork Scene Writing Course, the, the lessons are released as recordings every Sunday. Uh, so you don't have to be there live to watch them. And then the live components with the Q and A's and that kind of stuff, those are all recorded and posted afterwards. So uh, you won't miss anything. Let's see. So can you clarify the difference between having a protagonist be active versus passive and then being an outputter? Sure. All right. So let's give kind of a weird example. So let's say uh, Sean gave this example one time when we were when he was teaching at a at a workshop. So he's like, all right, let's say I uh, so Sean is the protagonist of the scene and I, Tim, bring Sean a glass of water. Right. So I'm coming into his life. And I'm handing him a glass of water. Now he can just accept the glass of water and take a drink, right? That would almost be kind of passive, just doing what's expected to, of it. Or he could knock the glass out of my hand and tell me to go fuck myself, right? Right. So there's like all these different ways that your protagonist can respond. And you do this in your own life, right? So like, let's say I walked into my house today and my wife was like, uh, so what do you have to say for yourself? I would probably stand there quietly trying to figure out what the fuck is going on and what she found out, right? So it's like, I would, if you were watching me, I would probably just be very still, but I am reacting to what she said. If she had not been there, I would have walked in, set my keys down, set my bag down, maybe gone and got a drink of water, but she knocked my life off balance, but I'm being passive. I'm not responding, right? So this goes into the freeze flight and fight responses, right? Is I would probably freeze in that standpoint. So you're, I'm still outputting, I'm still responding to the stimulus, even if I'm not doing anything. Does that make sense? Yeah. I know, like, I remember when, um, when they were first trying to explain to me, the protagonist is the outputter, and this, it was like, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And now I can't unsee it. But what I just try to think about is my own life, right? You're, you're always the protagonist in your own story, right? 
So you're always reacting to things that are coming at you, right? So you have what you're trying to do and the story happens when what you're planning doesn't work, right? So let's say I'm telling a story about walking out to my car and driving home. Well, if I just walk out to my car, put my bag in, drive home, no traffic, get home, there's no story there, right? There's no conflict. But if I'm walking out and there, my tire's flat, my world has just been knocked off balance, right? So your protagonist is always going in one direction, even if it is a response to an earlier scene, right? At the beginning of your scene, they're trying to get something. They have an object of desire they're going towards, and something comes in and stops them from going directly at that thing. And then they have to respond to that, and then something else happens, and they respond, and something else happens, and they respond. That's how a scene goes beat by beat. Um, yeah, all of this replies to short stories. Uh, the guild is like a, a, a long-term membership thing that you can get into, but this, what we're talking about today is this one particular 16 week course that is ends at the end of that 16 weeks. Um, Francine says, can we work on our own material during the course? We actually recommend that people don't work on their own material during the course. Um, we have found if people try to do that. Uh, you're, you end up trying to shoehorn your own story into the masterwork scene story. So how we see this is, um, is this 16 weeks is like learning to play scales on a piano or a guitar, right? You would never get up in front of an audience that's paid to see you play your instrument and just play the scales, right? The scales are what you practice so that you can play the things you actually want to play. So what we recommend you do is during this 16 weeks, you focus on just doing writing an original story, writing original stuff based on what we're teaching, because you're getting skill acquisition that you're then going to apply later. Again, it would be like if I want to be a woodworker and I get a chance to learn from a really great woodworker, I would just do what they told me for a while. And then when I go back and I do my own woodworking, then I can build whatever I want and I'm going to use all the skills that I got um, training. I missed the time slot to download the book. Can you make it available? I don't know what your response, what your review. <laughs> uh, I don't know what you mean by that. Um, what, what book, a time slot to download the book. I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, Kevin, my protagonist has two conflicting desires, which is what drives the plot. Get the girl or get the job. She wants both and can't figure out how to make it work. Does this go against the story grid principles? no. Um, it doesn't, right? That creates the conflict, right? So maybe, uh, well, my friend is dealing with this, right? He's got a girlfriend here in Nashville, and then he got a job opportunity in another town, and he knows they probably, you know, the the long distance thing is not going to work. So he's deciding between do I stay here for the girl or I go there for the job. That's a great setup for a story. And what he's trying to do is figure out what to do. And so the object of desire change it will change from scene to scene based on like well i you know maybe i'm trying to get both or maybe i'm trying to do it's hard to get into specifics but no that that is the thing that come that is the inciting incident right he would be staying with the girl with his life unless this job opportunity didn't come in or vice versa right so something he has to be on one path and an inciting incident comes in roger says I think it's also worth note. Let's see. Hold on. Let me just read through. Yeah. So, so Roger's basically saying at some point, the protagonist has to shift to being more proactive. Yes. But you have to understand there will never be a scene in your book where everything goes the way the protagonist thinks it will go. Right. That's, that's boring. Right. That's the, um, just just watch any any movie with this in mind is that even when the protagonist is like okay i'm setting out to fix this problem i want to fix this problem as soon as they start something comes in and causes chaos and it doesn't work right and if it does the movies that suck are the ones where the protagonist is like i'm going to do this and then they just do it right so it's not about whether or not you're um you can have um the, do not hear that your protagonist has to be passive. They're actively there. You could have one that's very actively trying to do something, but shit keeps coming in the way to get there. Right. 
So again, it's like, if I'm going out to my car, I'm being active. I am actively trying to get what I want, which is get my car and go home. And the story happens when shit starts getting in my way. And I have to respond to that before I can get what I want. So this is not about when I say your protagonist is responding, that doesn't mean they're passive. That just means shits come into their life they're not ready for and they have to respond to it. They can't be the one causing the shit for other people. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, I just talked to Eric. I know some of you ask questions. And then other, and then I answer them as I'm talking. So Eric, I think I answered your question just now. Um, with the crisis, my choices feel almost forced when I need to put two options for my protagonist. Is there a less subtle way to write this in a scene? Yeah. So one of the problems that you know I didn't have time to really get into is you never want to present an easy like if your reader. Uh, realizes there's no actual crisis here like um i don't i'm trying to think of something really off the wall right so something like um should i uh you know my my choices are do i punch my boss in the face and tell him to go fuck himself or do i just kind of take his uh take his reprimand right and most people are like well you would just take the reprimand to keep your job right so it's like you never want to put yourself in a position where it the crisis needs to be an actual crisis because this is going back to like how you show don't tell is we see who your character is by the choices they make in the crisis of the scenes, not by what you tell people who your character is, right? Just like I can tell you all day long that, um, I don't know, uh, oh, I, I could tell you, hey, I want to be a writer. I want to be a writer. My goal is to be a writer and write something great. But if I don't actually write anything and I don't work on my writing, you'll be like, OK, well, you're a liar. I can see by your actions what you say doesn't matter. So, yeah, you have to. Put, the whole point is that when an inciting incident comes in, your character keeps trying to get your protagonist keeps trying to get back. Like Mr. Bennett was just like, leave me alone. I want to keep walking through my garden like that's what he wanted. And then finally, the scene reaches a point where he's like, OK, I'm either going to really piss off my wife or I'm just going to go have to see this guy that just moved into the neighborhood. So that's an actual crisis. Right. And he chooses one or the other. And so, um, yeah, you have to push to a point where they have to do either A or B. I hope that's helpful. Um can you give real fiction examples or where I can find a really good one for each of the five commandments in one scene? Yeah. So uh, hold on one sec. Yeah. So we have these books at story grid. We have the murder of Roger Ackroyd. We have Frankenstein. We have the wonderful wizard of Oz. I don't have my, I can't find my copy. We have The Hobbit. We have several masterwork analysis guides that literally go scene by scene and they break it down in different ways, but you can see the five commandments. Uh, also, if you read our articles on the website about the five commandments, I think we have examples on those as well. What if the protagonist once desires the opposite of what they had before the inciting incident? Is that something that would work? So these kind of vague questions are hard to answer, but in general, it depends on it de if we're talking about, a, like, I'm just going to keep focusing on a scene. So your protagonist wants something at the beginning of the scene and things are getting in their way. The moment where they end up having to choose something other than what they wanted at the beginning is the crisis because they push to the point where they realize they're not going to get back to where they were they have to choose either best bad choice or irreconcilable goods so yes it does push them to the point where they decide to change their mind and want something else because they realize what they want they can't go back to what they wanted and this is a worldview thing too right it's like I won't get into that. Um, is the double factor problem the same as a theme or is there a slight difference? It's like um, the theme is almost your answer as the author 
or as the artist to the double factor problem, right? So if we say the double factor problem in The Hobbit is when do you stay home and stay safe? And when you do you leave and risk danger, right? If that's the double factor problem. Um, this is the double factor problem that Sam has, all right? The artist and author, which is you, has an opinion on when you should make each choice. And that's what you're showing in the story. Okay, so J.R.R. Tolkien is trying to help his kids know how to make that choice, but he wants them to make it the way he would make it, right? He thinks he knows how to answer this question, okay? So yeah, the theme is the, theme is the answer to the question, right? But uh, yeah, the theme is the answer to the double factor problem. Remember, the double factor problem is Sam. Sam has the problem. The author has the answer, and they're going to help them with the answer by telling a story. So like in my book, the author is a, um, a, is a business and family man who is in his 50s, and the Sam is a business and family man who's in his 20s, and he's coming to the businessman in his 50s to get some advice, right? So he has a problem that he's coming to the author with, and the author has an answer to the problem, but he's going to show him how to make these decisions by telling a story. How about the classical rule breakers? For example, there is not a single unnecessary detail in The Little Prince, for sure, but the world building, especially in fantasy and many great books, include a lot of theoretically unnecessary details making the world building great. So I would say, in like, depending on, okay, so... Um, have you ever heard that theory that you can't draw a perfect circle, like even with a computer, right? Like if you get down to it, it's still little jagged edges, right? So no matter how close we can get to doing a perfect circle, there is no such thing as drawing a perfect circle. The same thing goes for a story, right? So, or a book. Right. No matter how perfect this masterwork is written, and there's lots that we talk about inside a story grid, there's no such thing as a perfectly written book that you couldn't find some little tiny word choice problem that maybe you should do different. OK, so that so that's kind of my caveat to answering this is like like if you look at like um, Brandon Sanderson's writing, right, there's probably some details in there you don't need because he literally writes one draft. But in general, I would say the great fantasy works, even when they're super long, they do not have a lot of fat on them because those details are necessary to the story. A great writer is putting the right details into the story, even if there's a lot of them. So Game of Thrones would be an example of this, right? Is that lots of different characters, lots of different world building, but the world building is all necessary details to tell the story he's trying to tell. So... I wouldn't say that they're rule breakers, right? Now, there are stories that work and there's details in the story that you didn't need. Of course, that is absolutely true, but those are going to be like a very, 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 very small percentage of the details. I don't think in most masterworks there are rule breakers here. What if we can't find all the five C's in the book we are looking at? Um, they are there. If it's a work, if it's a working book, they are there, right? This is this is again. We're not saying to write a great story, you have to have the five commandments. We're saying in great stories are the five commandments. That's how it works. All the five commandments are, are how you track change in a story. And a great story is about change. And so this is how you track story. So they are there. Um, even if you don't have the, you can't identify them yet. Let's see. Do all your scenes have to have the same um, main desire, object, object of desire, Dorothy going home, or can scenes have their own desire specific to that scene? Right. So I was reviewing, I, I had it here, our master, the wonderful Wizard of Oz. And so the object of desire in the story, the overarching story is she wants to go home. Okay. Well, that starts solidifying into I've got to get to the Emerald City to see the Wizard of Oz because he's the one that's going to help me home. And then in an individual scene, I need to survive these things chasing me in the woods. 
Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to make it to the Emerald City and home. Okay. So what happens is, is in individual scenes, there's an object of desire that they are pursuing that they think will get them closer to their big overarching object of desire. Again, think about your own life. It works like this all the time, right? It's like, um, it's like if you're trying, to, if you have this overarching desire of, I want to get a promotion in my job, okay? Well, then that helps you make little decisions about what you're going to do. In this particular scene, I'm having a meeting and my boss who makes that decision is in the room. So my object of desire in this particular meeting is to impress my boss with my presentation, knowing that I think that'll get me a little bit closer to my overarching object of desire of getting a promotion at my job, okay? So yeah, there will be obviously, but you can tr you can tie the thread to what they want in this scene that they think will help them get their ultimate overarching object of desire. In this course, will there be any live feedback of our efforts to implement these concepts? There won't be any direct feedback on your particular work, but that's why we're putting you in a cohort so you guys can work together and give feedback on each other. That's what we found works really well in StoryGrid. I actually put an article out that on the site and sent it out a couple of weeks ago about this, about our focus on collaboration over community. Everything we do in the story grid, even among ourselves, we always do everything in a buddy system. So we always work on something together because we get closer to the best result by two people doing something or three people doing something together than by trying to do a large group would be impossible or just one person. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so... Um, this course, after you go through it, you will have you will have access to it forever into the we say as long as we're live and kicking at StoryGrid, you'll have access to it. So you'll be able to access the archives of all the training. You'll be able to access the recordings of all the live, uh, the live events, all of that stuff as well. Um an example of a scene with inciting it. Yeah. So somebody's asking for an example of a scene with the five commandments. So a couple things. One is literally pick up any great book and read a scene and the five commandments will be there. Any book. They, again, it's a reflection of reality. And then, um, and then again, if you want to look at individual, how, and then if you want to learn how to identify five commandments, we go over that in a lot of detail inside the masterwork scene writing course. Uh, I've written a book that needs help. Should I rewrite it attempting to include the ideas from story grid or should I start a new book? Ooh, that is a big question. Um, I mean, I don't, there's no way I can possibly answer that question just by not knowing, uh, because it, this is a great double factor problem. It depends, right? Like the first thing that came to my mind is how important is this particular story to you, right? That I think that plays a role. Um, I think um, there's all kinds of questions that would go into that. If you have a finished manuscript and you want somebody, you want an editor to read it, to tell you what to do next with it, you can go to storygrid.com and we have um, certified editors there that you can reach out to and hire. If you don't know who to hire, you can reach out. There's a form there you can fill out and we'll recommend an editor to you. Um. Does this mean the protagonist has to be in every scene? Nope. Um, what we talk about is, and this is an example from Pride and Prejudice, is in that first scene, um, Mr. Bennett is the protagonist of that particular scene, where if you scale back and look at the whole manuscript, it's, um, fuck, I still forgot her name. Eli I, is it Elizabeth? Um, anyway, I'm, that's going to drive me crazy. Uh, but yeah, so no, and each now each scene will have its protagonist. And if you're reading a book and you want to know who the protagonist of that scene is, it's the person responding throughout the vast majority of the scene. So when we look beat by beat, 
there are times where a protagonist of the scene can be the inputter, but that should be few and far between. And what we want people to do is write, when we get people to do this, we're like, write the whole scene and your protagonist is only allowed to respond. They're only allowed to be the outputter because you'll be closer than if you try to weave it all in. Uh, where can we find the recording of this webinar? I will send it out tomorrow. Yeah, so, okay, so still getting, again, maybe, yeah, this question was asked like 20 minutes ago. I think if you go to uh, the five command, if you just go to storygrid.com, scroll to the bottom or scroll down, there's all these lists of articles and we have an article on the five commandments. And I think in there is specific examples in a scene. Um, if you, you can also buy one of our masterwork analysis guides and it literally every scene of the book has the five commandments broken down for you. I have a hard time wrapping my head around every scene needing conflict, though I think my hangup is the magnitude of the conflict. Yeah. So think about conflict doesn't mean like bare knuckle boxing, right? It doesn't mean what here's conflict. The protagonist wants something and shit's getting in the way and they can't get what they want. Now I have conflict, right? Again, just using my simple example of I want to drive home. I want to drive home. I walk out. My tire is flat. Now there's conflict, right? Something is conflicting with what I want in the world. Now I have a story, right? So if your protagonist is just breezing through, getting what they want every time they try, and the, there is no tension, there is no conflict, there is no story, right? Because a story is what happens when my protagonist doesn't get what they want, right? They have to start figuring out how to change. Yeah, uh, you want an example, uh, Rebecca put this in here, I'm just going to say it, uh, you want an example of fantastically written conflict, read Hill, the short story Hills Like White Elephants by uh, uh, Hemingway. Um, yeah, yeah, if you've ever been in a relationship with somebody, you will read that and be like, yeah, I know what that is. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Joanne F., uh, if you had a problem downloading that, just shoot an email to support at storygrid.com and we'll get you taken care of. My story is character driven and told in multi point of view. I'm constantly working on not repeating the same scene over and over again since they are, are, are all in the same room where it happens. They are all having different reactions. So that would be the input and output, right? Also, would that also be a whole different beat? Okay. So there's a couple of things I would say here. So, um, okay. I, uh, I, because I can't talk about anything without bringing up jujitsu, um, I'm going to use jujitsu as an example. So I'm a purple belt in jujitsu. So I've been training for six and a half years. Um, when, and now I run one of our basics class. So when people first sign up for jujitsu, they've never done it before. I run that class. All right. When they come in, the first thing I teach them is not the most complicated move I know. I know some really complicated jujitsu. I don't try to get new people to do that. I want them to do the basics. So here's what we recommend for most writers. If you have never written anything that works before, you've never written a novel before, taking on as your first thing a multi-point of view, what you just described to me is a really, really hard book to write. So one of the books that I wanted to write a book like was, um, and then there were none by Agatha Christie. And then I read how, I think that was the book she, it was, I think that was the one where she said that was the hardest book she ever wrote. And I'm like, okay, maybe I should try something else. So what you're describing can be done. Absolutely can be done. All of the tools of story grid would apply and help with that. What I'm telling you is, you are taking off, you are biting off a really, really big thing is your first thing. And it's going to be really, really hard to get it right. Um, like this book that I'm writing now that I just finished now, it is first person point of view. Every single scene is from his point of view. It's told from his point of view, no other character's point of view. And I just tell the story in a linear path from his point of view, because I needed to write something and get it right. That was easy. 
still not easy, but easier, right? So I wanted to take as much complexity off the table. And then as I become a better and better writer, I will take on more and more complex stories because I'll actually know how to do them. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. All right. Is it possible for the protagonist to change what they want over the course of the story? Absolutely. This is called a worldview shift, right? This is great stories where like um, the dad's working too much because he's trying to build a business and that's what he's after. He thinks that kind of power is going to make him happy. And then by the end of the story, he's lost a job and he realizes he actually wants a family, right? So like um, the family man is about this, with the Nick Cage movie, right? At the beginning, he thinks he's happy with his big, powerful job and he realizes that doesn't make him happy. What he wants is a relationship, right? So of course, that is exactly what stories that work are about is about the, the protagonist realizing like, oh, what I wanted was the wrong thing. So the object of desire changes by the end of the story. Does story grid have any hard rules about the first chapter? I'm finding the beginning of my story the hardest to get right. No. Um, in fact, I'm reading. So recently I read a book called Gaudy Night by Dorothy Sayers uh, that was written in 1935. Um, one of her masterworks. And the inciting incident didn't hit until page, I think, like 61. Um, and then I just started reading yesterday or yeah, yesterday, uh, What Alice Forgot by Leanne Moriarty. And the inciting incident is like the first couple paragraphs of the book, right? Now, I will say a really great rule of thumb is to just start with the inciting incident. The first scene is the inciting incident of your story and then go from there. But there that is not a rule that is a rule of thumb okay because you'll find lots and lots of examples of books that don't have the global inciting incident as the first scene but that's a great place to start um all right oh wow we're already past 3 30 i'm gonna i'm happy to keep answering questions for a little bit so uh, if you want to stay on i'm happy to keep answering questions because my zoom chat is showing 53 new messages still um yeah. Do you use different masterworks for this course each semester or is it always Jane Eyre? Yeah, we have a few that we rotate through. This one in particular is Jane Eyre in a lover's meet scene. But the structure of the course stays, what you learn in the course stays the same. We just use a different masterwork. Um, I'm answering a lot of these. So uh, Judas says, please define Sam. So Sam is single audience member, all right? And we just use Sam for short. And so single audience member is the person your author is telling the story to. It has to be a, a specific person for this to work. Um, just like when you're telling a story, uh, you're telling a story to one person and you're trying to tell a story to them that will keep them engaged and interested in the story. Yeah, not all published books are great stories. That's true. Um, we look at masterworks and we have a definition of what a masterwork is on the website if you're interested in that. Um, one little thing I struggle with is the progressive complications. It's sometimes difficult to gauge when too much is too much. Some books, movies I've experienced get silly with these things. I don't want to fall into the trap. Okay. I love this question. So I struggle with this too. So when we map uh, the five skeletal scenes of the story, it's the five commandments, right? Inciting incident through resolution for each of the four quadrants. Well, that's only 20 scenes and a book is a lot longer than 20 scenes in most cases. And so what do you do between the inciting incident and the turning point? Okay. So I'm going to give you what Leslie uh, taught me to figure this out. So she's like, all right, so you have your inciting incident. She's like, you have what your protagonist wants. She's like, just start throwing out ways that he could uh, get what he wants. So in one particular arc, he needs money. Okay, so basically he owes somebody $80,000 and he does not have $80,000. So the inciting incident is you have to pay back this $80,000. And then the turning point is later. So she's like, what are things that he might do 
uh, to try to get the money. And I'm like blocked at first. I'm like, I don't know. She's like, she's like, all right, Tim, he could go rob a bank to get the money. I'm like, oh, okay. So I just, we literally just start throwing ideas. What could my character do to try to get $80,000? He could borrow it from people. He could rob a bank. He could get a loan. And I just start listing out like 12 different things. And then we pick the one, then we go back and we're like, all right, which ones are ridiculous? Okay, robbing a bank doesn't fit this story. Here's some, okay, what order that should they go in? And boom, here's my four progressive complications of how, what's what he's going to do between the inciting incident and the turning point. So yeah, of course, progressive complications can get um, out of control and silly. But also like a friend of mine who's a writer, KJ Dilatania, we we're talking the other day and she's like, um, She's like, don't, she, she said, this is what she always reminds herself is don't make it more complicated, make it worse for your protagonist. So all I'm trying to do is just figure out how to make it worse and worse and worse for my protagonist. So he keeps trying like crazier and crazier things to get what he wants. And each time it doesn't work and it, it actually leaves them off well, worse off. Right. Um, Yeah. And I usually tell people what we see, actually, that you could be different, Kevin, but what we see people is what you think is pushing to an eight is usually like a four. So we're like, tell people, go all the way, like push everything. That's what I kept doing in my stories. Like, I want to make this as painful as possible. I want to go as far as I possibly can. I actually just finished this book like two days ago called Invisible Monsters by uh, Chuck Pelinek, who wrote The Fight Club. Uh, I think this was actually the first book he wrote that got rejected and then Fight Club got picked up and then um, later uh, he got this published and he does this really well in this book of just pushing things as far as they'll possibly go. Um, but yeah, that's how that's how I deal with progressive complications. Will we have access to the material after the six weeks, 16 weeks? Yep, you'll have forever access. You can go back and review. Um my story is in first person. Is the protagonist always the narrator? No, uh, the protagonist does not have to be the narrator. Uh, so for instance, um, the Sherlock Holmes books, right? Dr. Watson is the narrator, but he's not the protagonist of the story. So no. Um, so it can be first person, but see, this is what helps with the narrative device is if your author is a character in the story, but not the protagonist, they can only know what they know and they can only know what they see, right? So this is where you can do some, like uh, uh, the murder of Roger Ackroyd is a really, really cool example of this um, where the protagonist, Hercule Poirot, is not the narrator. Uh, and it, it has a really cool twist to that in the book. I don't want to ruin it on this, even though I think we're past the point of spoiling when that book's been out. How does the point of view fit into the narrative device? So the point of view is a separate, a separate thing. We look at that separate from their, the narrative device. Now, of course, they all affect each other, but figuring out the point of view is not the same thing as uh, figuring out the uh, narrative device. So um, it will, will affect it because, of course, if it's somebody like your author could be somebody in the story, right? Um, also, like in the case of The Hobbit, the grandfather is not in the story, The Hobbit. He's telling a story in third person about this this thing that happened, right? So it it does affect it, but it is a separate discussion. Should the Sam be the same as your protagonist? Not always. So um, your but your protagonist and Sam have to be dealing with the same double factor problem. So. Because the protagonist in the story is standing in for Sam. So we have to see the protagonist dealing with the same double factor problem. But, um, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien's grandchild it was not a hobbit. <laughs> so they don't have to be the exact same person or even the same species, right? Um, but they do have to be dealing with the same double factor problem because that's why we're telling the story to Sam is to watch our protagonist solve this double factor problem. Uh, so Sharon says, can you estimate the average number 
of hours required for participants of the 16 week course. I answer this in the FAQ. I think it's roughly five hours, right? So if you set aside an hour to two to go through the training, set aside an hour to two to go through the worksheets, and then set aside an hour to work with a cohort, it's around five hours. Elizabeth Bennett. Yes. Thank you for all of you that put it in here. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. We, oh, we, I forgot about that. We do have a book called the five commandments of storytelling. So if you want to learn more about that, we do have a book about that. <laughs> um, yeah, we talked about the conflict. Ben says, I found that writing short snippets from my dungeons and dragons game has helped frame my mind around conflict perspective and world building. I also get to test it out against my players. Breaking down the task into tiny bits has helped me a lot. Yeah. And there's a really great Dungeons and Dragons uh, or Dungeon Master book called, uh, I think it's like the Lazy Man's Guide to Dungeon Mastering or the Lazy Dungeon Master's Guide or something like that um, that I read that was really cool and actually helped me kind of see what some of the things we teach at StoryGrid from a new perspective. Uh, Peter, I answered the question about how much time I think I'm getting close to answering all the questions. If you have a question I haven't answered that you want me to answer or I missed your question, go ahead and pop it in there and I'll try to answer it before uh, the end. Let's see. Yeah, we offer this um, semi-regularly throughout the year. Uh yeah, what about gauging the progressive complications within a single scene? It's the same idea, which is like at the beginning of the scene that they have an object of desire, something comes in and knocks that off balance. Before we get to the crisis, um, the the um, protagonist needs to try several things to get back to the way things were, right? So for instance, if we're writing a scene about a fight between uh, spouses, a husband and wife, First, the, the husband might say, like, if the husband is, in, is the protagonist, he might try to, like, be like, hey, look, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. Like, try to just quell it. And then that didn't work. So it's like, okay, well, try to over explain myself. Well, that didn't work. Well, now I'm going to fight and be like, why are you getting angry? Like, so it's like, I'm going to keep trying different things. Um, and each thing is going, like, um, you know, um, for instance, like Sean always uses, like I get up in the morning and I'm making coffee, right? And let's say we go and we realize uh, we're out of coffee. The first thing we're going to try is not to drive to the grocery store and break in and steal coffee, right? Like that's not going to be the, the first thing we're going to do is say like, oh, do I have any other coffee in the house? Nope, I don't have any other coffee in the house. Well, maybe... Uh, maybe my wife put it somewhere else. So I go and ask my wife, Hey, is there any coffee in the house? She says, no. Okay. Well now what am I going to do? I guess I could drive to the gas station. They're open 24 seven. They'll have coffee. I get there. Oh, they don't have coffee. Right. So it's like, we always try the, we do this automatically in our life, which is like, we try the easiest thing to get what we want. And if that doesn't work, we try the next easiest thing and it keeps ratcheting up the more it doesn't work. Um, all right. I think I got to everything. So that only took almost two hours. Um, so uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, there's still uh, lots of you on here. So I really appreciate it. I hope you got a lot out of it. Um, I love talking about this stuff. So uh, anytime I can get uh, some writers together to talk about this stuff, I always have a good time. Uh, so thanks so much for being here. I do recommend uh, that you check out the Masterwork Scene Writing course. Uh, you can sign up for that. We're going to get started on July 2nd. It's a really fantastic course. You're going to learn all this stuff that I had to get Shock Monkey to learn. You're going to learn it in a much easier to digest way. Uh, that's really going to make a big difference in your writing. So highly recommend you join us for that. But either way, thanks so much for being here. And we'll see you down the road. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Bye-bye.